The iOS and iPadOS 18 public betas are out, and I want to cover some of the uh, the top level changes in these releases. I, of course, will be doing my full detailed walkthrough in September when these OSs are officially and fully out. Uh, but for right now, I wanted to cover all the big top level stuff that I, I think is pretty exciting. This video is sponsored by Sofa. Let's get into it. The home screen got new customization options in iOS and iPadOS 18. First up, icons and widgets can now be placed anywhere. Weirdly, widgets could be placed anywhere in iPadOS 17, but not iOS 17. But now apps and widgets on iOS or iPadOS can be placed anywhere you want. When customizing the home screen, there is now an edit button in the top left corner. This gives you options to either add widgets or customize the home screen. Under the customization options, there are a few things you can do here. First up, you can choose between light, dark, or an automatic mode for your home screen. This will not only change the widgets, but the app icons as well. For first party Apple apps, there is now a light and a dark mode version of their app icons. Third party apps can supply their own dark mode versions of their app icons as well now. If the app icon is a two tone icon, typically something with like a white background, the system will try and do a smart invert of it. Some icons like the YouTube and drafts icon look really good like this. Under the icon customization menu, there is now a tent option. This kind of applies a filter on top of your home screen. Personally, I don't care for this. The only way I've found to make this look good is if you take away all the saturation and just use a black and white theme. This really needs some tweaking so that it's not just a filtered layer on top of the home screen. There are a couple of more features in the customization menu. There is now a large icon mode. This does exactly what it says on the tin. Makes your icons large but it also gets rid of the text labels underneath the icon. I wish there was the ability to remove text labels, but keep the icons the small size. The last feature in this menu is the ability to dim the wallpaper. This will be on by default if you select dark mode. This helps a lot if you have like a bright light wallpaper, but use dark mode. The images I use already fit dark mode, so I just leave this setting off. Control Center got one of the biggest overhauls in years. It's now completely customizable with support for multiple pages and third-party controls. Instead of going into settings, you can now edit Control Center right from within it. Just hit the plus button in the top left corner of the Control Center. In here, you can add different toggles and controls. There are options for opening up apps like music or calculator to toggling settings to triggering actions like the new tap to cache or accessibility features like control nearby devices. There is a ton in here. Third party apps will be able to update to support this feature as well come the official release in the fall. I have a couple of betas right now that I've been using, but the one that I've really enjoyed using is dark noise. I can trigger scenes right from inside the control center. This made me realize that a lot of third party control center toggles are going to replace a lot of uh, one to three action shortcuts that I use. When adding these controls, you can resize them into a small, medium and large control just by dragging the corner. There is also the ability to add multiple pages. As far as pages I have set up right now, I have a general settings one, a shortcuts page for running all my most used shortcuts, a now playing screen, and home controls. Though right now I'm actually in the middle of rebuilding my smart home because I'm just having all sorts of weird issues with it since I moved, so I'm deleting everything and re-adding it, so it's not completed. You can swipe your finger across the edge of these pages to jump between them quickly. After all, Control Center is meant to be a place to toggle things quickly. The customizable Control Center may be my favorite change in this update. With third-party support, there is going to be a lot you can do in this. The iPhone's lock screen got a couple of nice feature updates thanks to the new Control Center. You can now change the buttons at the bottom. Go into the edit mode and tap on these. You can access a lot of the features that are in Control Center from this page. This includes stuff like running a shortcut, quick note, the ability to open third party apps and more. What's great about this is if you use a third party camera app, you can swap it out with the default one. 
Or if you're like me and use multiple lock screens and focus modes, you can set up automations to toggle between these and then set up different controls on different lock screens for whatever those situations are. For example, when I'm home, I replace the camera toggle with the Apple TV remote. Remember, you can always swipe to the left on the lock screen to get the default camera app. There is a lot you can do with this, but unfortunately you are still limited to two buttons on the lock screen and can't add more. This video is sponsored by Sofa. Sofa is a media tracking app that can help you keep everything you want to watch, read, or play all in one place. This way, nothing falls between the cushions. With Sofa, you can track movies, TV shows, games, books, and more. Sofa is extremely customizable. I set up a queued section for everything I want to watch, read, or play. Then a completed section for everything I have finished. Sofa also has built-in smart lists that take advantage of things like status, ratings, or even tags. I set up one that has all of my all-time favorite media in it. This is basically anything I rank five stars. Then another that is tagged family. This is stuff that I think would be good for me and my girlfriend to watch together. Then there is sections like the pile, logbook, and pinned. I love the idea of the pile. It's a place where you, if you hear about something, you can quickly add it. Then when you have a minute, you can organize it later. I'm using the pen section for things I'm currently watching, playing, or reading. This way, this stuff doesn't get lost in recommendations. It's incredibly quick to add media into Sofa as well. Sofa is the perfect app for having all of the media you want to consume in one spot. I know for me, if I don't write something down, it's going to get forgotten about. Sofa is extremely flexible, so you can set it up just about any way you want. It has a ton of different themes and app icons. Sofa is completely free to download and try out. You can use the link in the description below to get 40% off an annual membership. My thanks to Sofa for sponsoring this video and all of my WWDC coverage. The calculator app is now on the iPad and got overhauled on the iPhone. For the most part, they do the same thing. There is a new scientific calculator option. I'm not gonna even try and pretend I know what half of this stuff does, but it's here if you need it. The much more interesting feature though is Math Notes. Math Notes is a way to write out problems and have the system solve them for you. On both the iPhone and iPad, you can type out problems. But on the iPad, you can use the Apple Pencil to handwrite things out. This is the much more interesting use case for this. You can use this for things like back of the napkin math, a scratch pad, figuring out complex problems, or even graphing. Math Notes isn't just for simple problems. You can set variables, meaning you can configure letters or even words to a value. Then use those variables for your various problems. It's not just limited to one. If the value of those variables changes, you can go in and edit it in the math note and your equation will update automatically. Math Notes is also in the Notes app as well. Everything you can do in the Math Notes in the Calculator app, you can do in the Notes app. In fact, when you create a Math Note document in the Calculator app, it syncs over to Notes into a special folder. I really like this kind of syncing between the system. The only thing that's different between using uh, Math Notes in the Notes app and Math Notes in Calculator is you can change how it shows the results. So in the Notes app, you can have it set up to always show you the results, suggest results, or just turn off giving you the results altogether. There are a couple of other nice changes to the Notes app. First, you can now collapse sections of text notes. This is nice when you're done writing in a section, you can then hide that section and just kind of mark it as complete, essentially. Then there is the ability to highlight type text. This is great for calling out important parts of your note. Then there is audio recordings and notes. The obvious use case for this is recording a lecture or a meeting while you are taking notes. But the really cool thing about this is it does live transcription of the audio while it's recording. When you're done recording audio, it then embeds that into the note alongside the transcript. But the killer new feature in Notes is SmartScript. SmartScript takes your handwritten text, learns how you write, and then adjusts it to make it more legible and even. It's actually wild how this works, and I'm gonna have a detailed video about this with some really interesting guests coming very soon. To enable this, go into the Pencil Kit toolbar, select the menu, and enable auto-refine handwriting. As you write, SmartScript even does spell checking and will underline words and suggest replacements. But when words are replaced, it's not just with a font, it's with your handwriting, which is really cool. 
Once you're done writing, you can select all the text from the menu and pick straighten. This will take all of your handwritten text and make it more uniform. Same size, straight on the line, and a bit more compact. This works most of the time, though I have had a couple of instances where it just like takes all the text and like drops it on top of each other. It was weird bug. Overall, I think SmartScript is going to be a really big deal for people that do handwritten text. It works in any app that supports the native pencil kit toolbar. So if you go into files and open up a PDF and enable the pencil utilities, you're going to get SmartScript in there if you start writing on top of that PDF. But you're not going to get it in apps like GoodNotes or Notability. Those kinds of apps uh, created their own handwriting engine, so they're going to have to implement their own version of that. Or, but if you want to use SmartScript, you're going to want to look for apps that have that native pencil kit toolbar like Notes does. Files got a few awesome updates I have been waiting for. First, you can now pin files and folders from iCloud. This way they stay on your device locally and don't get removed to save storage. Now they're still syncing with iCloud. You can make changes to them. They're just not being offloaded. While I don't mind the system offloading most of my documents to the cloud, there's just like a handful of folders and files and stuff that I just always want to be on my device. And now I can pin them so that they're always on my device. Files also finally got support for formatting external drives. Just long press on the drive and select erase. You now have the option for APFS, XFAT, or regular old FAT. If you're not sure what to pick, if you are on all Apple devices, like you have an iPad, an iPhone, a Mac, whatever, just pick APFS. If that's what you're just going to use that drive for, just pick APFS. If you're going to, you know, use that drive with like a Windows machine or something else, then you're going to want to pick XFAT. Now, this isn't full disk utility, but it's something, and I'm so happy it's there. There has been several times where I've needed to format an external drive. And in fact, one particular time I needed to format an external drive and use it like right away. And I couldn't because I just had an iPad. So I actually had to drive over to my brother's house, use his Mac to format it and then drive back home. That was a little ridiculous. But that's it. That is kind of a first look at iOS and iPadOS 18. I, of course, will have my big walkthrough on iPadOS and iOS in September when these OS updates are officially out, when they're officially released. But I just wanted to cover all the high-level stuff in case you're installing the public betas. My thanks to Sofa for sponsoring this video. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't already, and have a great day.